All right, guys, I think we are now live for another part of our continuing series here. And we appreciate everybody tuning in either live or watching us later on. Of course, I'm Bernard Nomberg, Nomberg Law Firm in Birmingham. And we're doing a series of discussions throughout this time period with different uh, experts in different areas of, the, of society. And what we're talking about uh, in these Monday and Thursday talks at one o'clock is how the pandemic is affecting different parts of society. And I've got on with me today, Montgomery attorney Lance Gould with Beasley Wilson, or Beasley Hound, excuse me, golly. But Lance, thank you for coming on and spending a few minutes with us today. Glad to be on, uh, Robert. I appreciate you asking me to join you. And uh, I hope that the discussion today will be helpful to you and uh, all the viewers and all your clients. Well, I know that it'll be very very much new information to a lot of folks. Even attorneys who practice law don't know much about these cases unless you're specifically handling them. But, but for those of you who are tuning in and watching this, we're talking about whistleblower cases. And you may have heard those in the headlines. You may have read a little bit about them. But until we kind of dig a little bit into this, it's difficult to explain other than it's when an employee finds out something about their company and what they do about it. But Lance, before we get into that, if you would tell us a little bit about yourself and your practice in Montgomery. Well, I, uh, like I said, I practice with Beasley Allen Law Firm. We have offices in Montgomery, Alabama and Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, we have approximately 80 lawyers. We have, we're broken down into different departments. We do personal injury uh, for people who have serious injuries related to defective products. We have a mass tort section that handles a lot of the drugs and devices that have been pulled off the market and harmed the patients. And then we have a toxic tort group that handles, uh, they handle a lot of the BP oil spill cases. And now they're representing several state, a couple of states and some, uh, municipalities in the opioid litigation. Uh, the section I'm in is consumer fraud. We handle lots of different consumer protection issues, class actions, and we also handle employment law. And where the whistleblower comes in, in this, in the consumer protection side of it is, the False Claims Act, it protects and allows the government and individuals to file a lawsuit to recover against companies who have defrauded the government. Um, I've been practicing with Beasley Allen for over uh, 23 years, and we just practice in a lot of different areas. Well, you guys have done such great work over the last several decades, Mr. Beasley, and all of the, the principals there. And I know so many of you guys and really enjoy doing business with you all for, for so many years, including one of my classmates from growing up, Mike Andrews. And I've had Mike on my show before. And, he does such a great job with the aviation cases and just really is such an aggressive uh, representative, as you all are uh, in your types of cases. I want to welcome one of your partners, Gibson Vance, one of my buddies, Eric Easley, Neil Drucker, Bob Greenberg, and some others who are on with us now, Lance. But I want to I want to jump into to whistleblower cases. And in its broadest terms, how do you describe, for those who don't know what those types of cases are about, in general, what, what are they about and, and how and why are they important to the public and uh, to know about how they're, those are types of cases? Yeah, and we see whistleblower a lot on television and in the newsprint. And what we've seen lately are individuals within the government agencies reporting uh, the way they're handling certain, uh, through this pandemic, how the agencies making rulings, findings, and they come forward with things that they feel are inappropriate. Now that's not the type of cases that we're dealing with. Um, the whistleblower cases we deal with is like I said, it's under the False Claims Act. And what it allows uh, the government and individuals to do is to recover taxpayer dollars. Anybody or company that submits a fraudulent claim to the government for payment can be held liable. And why is it so important to just the, uh, the government, but the individuals is taxpayer dollars. 
uh, uh, since 1986, under the False Claims Act, the government has covered over $62 billion. Um, in 2019, they recovered $3 billion um, under the False Claims Act. Now, of the $3 billion, $2.6 billion of the recovery came directly from the healthcare industry. And that's what we're going to see right now. Uh, the government is in a situation to, they're pulling out all the stops to try to find a cure, first of all the, to obtain the personal protection gear for all of the hospital, all your first responders. So they're out doing everything they can to get the uh, equipment and the gear. And what's, what we'll see happen eventually is companies take advantage of this. They will sell them substandard products. They will misrepresent the quality of the products. Um, they may even misrepresent the cost of the products. And so what, what you're able to do or what the False Claims Act did, and the purpose of it is it offered an incentive for any employees to see the company that you work for, or even if it's not a company you work for, if you see a company defrauding the government, making misrepresentations about the product, about the quality of the product, then you can come forward with that information and file a lawsuit on behalf of the government. And the law currently is any recovery based on the claims that you bring forward, you're entitled to 15 to 30% of the recovery. And the, the purpose of the False Claims Act is to incentivize individuals that are aware of fraudulent uh, conduct to come forward. And there are also protections for those individuals from retaliation within their company if they're demoted. Um, that brings a whole new set of claims. Lance, tell us, give us a couple of real life examples of these types of cases what are what are some cases that you've either handled in the past just give us some fact scenarios so people can can really can relate to to real world issues that are going on in these types of cases uh, uh in the on the healthcare side of it what we've seen there was recently uh, a case resolved where um uh the heart surgeon he was implanting heart stents in to patients when it was not medically necessary. And they would turn around and bill Medicaid and Medicare for those surgeries. I mean, just millions of dollars that the one doctor was uh, reaping from Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, we've seen a lot of cases recently in the hospice care. Uh, individual, in order for hospice to come in, there has to be uh, a medical finding or basis to say that this patient is terminally ill and meaning that they're near death. And we've seen a lot of companies that are falsifying records and keeping patients on in hospice. I think they're only entitled to stay on for 90 days. So they'll cycle them off and then come back and pick them up in another month or so and rebuild all over for another 90 days. You're seeing that in the healthcare industry. Um, you'll see drugs that may be manufactured and FDA approved for certain symptoms, say like the drugs that are uh, approved for procedures. However, the drug representatives and the companies go out and market the doctors, uh, it's called off-label use. Uh, a, a use, they say it's the sales representatives market, market the drug as curing one thing when it has not been approved by the FDA for that. Um, from the government contracting side, anybody who contracts with uh, any government agency, Department of Defense, Department of Transportation, um, United States Postal Service, then they're in into contracts and they're agreeing to produce a certain quality of product. Uh, one example was there was a case with the Department of Transportation where a company was to build guardrails. And the contract is very specific. It called for the certain grade of steel in the guardrails. Well, the company did not use the, that grade of steel, and it was found out that there were numerous wrecks with those guardrails where the guardrails were splintering and shooting through the vehicles and killing people. 
think there were three or four instances of serious injury or death related to the guardrails. Uh, another example of a department's uh, defense contract, uh, a company had contracted uh, to make all the repairs and services for all the aircraft and the contract specifically called for original parts. Well, the company in order to save money was using aftermarket parts, not just for the uh, saving money, but now you're putting the lives of all the pilots at risk and the people in these aircraft, uh, the military service. So we see a lot of that too, where the shortcuts that companies take to make money is risking the lives of our military service. And in the case of the Department of the Transportation and the public as a whole, going down and driving these interstates. But what you have to come back to is all of this is taxpayer dollars. They are taking money out of our pockets and when they defraud the government. It's each of these cases sound like money is trying to be saved and they're trying to, to pull pull one over on the government in some way to save, save themselves money. But the reality is almost in all of these situations, lives are potentially at stake lives can be lost or, or serious consequences, injuries and things. So if a person, Lance, is uh, suspects that the company they work for, the people they work with are doing something illegal or, or like this, what's the process? What's, how, does, how does an individual go about reporting it and, and starting this process? Well, one thing that there was a study where approximately 75% of the whistleblowers that had filed lawsuits had actually reported the misconduct within their company. And the company uh, upper management did not have the appropriate uh, guidelines in order to where the information was passed up and was made, or the company just completely ignored it and said, we're going to continue to profit regardless. So the first step would be, a lot of times they report it within internal, but you should, an individual should talk to a lawyer who um, is familiar with the False Claims Act and the whistleblower guidelines, how to file the lawsuit. The lawsuit um, is not just the average lawsuit. You don't just go file it in court. But when it's filed, you have to file it under seal and it remains under seal initially for 90 days, and the government may be able to request an extension to keep it under seal while the government investigates it. Not only do you file a lawsuit with the court, then you have to serve the, a copy of the lawsuit on the uh, United States Attorney General and the, assist, or the U.S. Attorney in the district where you're filing the lawsuit. So before someone goes to talk to a lawyer about this, they should make sure that the lawyer understands the uh, False Claims Act and is able to advise them in the proper way. Because you know a lot of companies also have guidelines about what documents. You're not supposed to be taking company documents and things of that nature. One problem is, is we you need an attorney that can advise you what documents you can and cannot remove from your employer without him violating any guidelines or laws because documents are real important when you're investigating one of these cases because you can't just file a lawsuit based on somebody, an uh, employee coming in and saying, here's what's going on. That's not going to be enough for a whistleblower attorney to proceed with the claim. Lance, it must take a real strong personality, a real strong uh, sense of wanting to be the right thing to be done for somebody to step forward. A few minutes ago, you were mentioning there's anti-retaliation provisions or things that can be done. But if I'm just a, an average hourly employee, but I discover something that's going on, but I'm afraid I'm the sole breadwinner for my house and they're relying on me in this job, what are some things that you can relay to people that helps give them a little piece of comfort, a little bit of, of, of knowledge, knowing that if you come forward, 
there are th there are things that help to protect you, even if you're doing this. Yeah, and that Robert, that is a very serious thing of uh, the retaliation. And as much as the guideline, as much as the um, retaliation provisions allow you to be reinstated to your previous position at the same salary or have received any salary increases that you should have received, they're there, but the individual has to know there are certain uh, risks uh, with this because if you're a whistleblower, you're going to be, may have to end up working in that same office where the people mm -hmm. you brought the whistle on or co-employees. But there are, you have those guidelines and those protections that you can be reinstated. One good thing about the lawsuit is it's filed under seal. And well, I've seen these cases stay under seal for two to three years while the government is investigating the lawsuit. And during that time, the relator's name generally is not known. A lot of times the lawsuit is not known. Most of the time the, law, the company does not know there's a lawsuit. Now they have some idea that there's a lawsuit out there because you have government agencies coming in asking for documents, asking questions and interviewing people. So one thing is that the protection of the case being under seal keeps the identity of the relator unknown for a certain amount of time. And then hopefully by the time the case comes out from under seal and he finds out about it, you, the government or the lawyers will have enough evidence to where the case will be successful at that point. And then that would be when the employee would be, you know, have some relief from having to work in that environment if they have another job during the time while the investigation is going on. So the main thing is, I think that the individual needs to know is when they come to a lawyer, it's not going to come out automatically. You have time to wait, you want to find another job or remain where you are and let the investigation process play out um, before you're revealed that there is a lawsuit. Lance, will the, the client, I'm going to call him the client, the whistleblower who comes to you and you initiate a lawsuit because there, there seems to be claims there. Will the, the whistleblower themselves ultimately be called to testify or is that just a case by case uh, decision? It, generally a case, case by case decision. And, um, you know, it's according to what information there are, the, government or the attorneys are able to obtain during their investigation. And uh, generally there will, generally you would most likely be called to testify unless there's just overwhelming evidence that the government's able to. And, and a lot of times the government is able to obtain the information before the case comes out from under seal and there's never any testimony by, by because of the documents that they obtain during their investigation, then they're able to negotiate a settlement uh, with the company. So that happens a lot. So, you know, it's according to how far the case progresses. The case actually has to be litigated. There's a chance, but the majority of these cases, um, if they're pursued, they're, they're generally uh, settled before you get to the giving testimony to the opposing side. Gotcha, gotcha. For guys who are just joining us or may watch us later on, I'm talking with Lance Gould, attorney with Beasley Allen in Montgomery. Lance and his department handle these false claims act cases, also sometimes known as whistleblower cases. Lance, how can folks get in touch with you at the firm in case they want to talk about maybe they have a case to, to run by you and your team? Um, if they would go to the, our website, BeasleyIsland.com, we have uh, have a chat set up that you can click on, and you can tell uh, have some. We have a live person communicating with you, obtaining your information, contact information. That is generally the easiest way to to get in touch with us. Also, on our website, we have our um, phone number on there that they can reach out to us um, by phone and just tell us. They mentioned they have a potential whistleblower claim. 
then they'll get you in touch with the right group of lawyers here at Beasley Allen. Okay, very good. And I put a clickable link in the comments section for any of you guys want to start that process. Lance, I have a couple of questions from attorney friends of mine in different parts of the country. Carol in South Florida asks, are these all federal claims or is there any interaction with state court? There are, there is interaction with state claims on occasion um, because there are approximately a little over 30 states that have their own False Claims Act and you would be able to uh, claims on behalf of the state. Here in Alabama, we do not have a False Claims Act. Um, Florida does, but I'm not sure off the top of my head, but there are some states to where you will file under the Federal False Claims Act and include uh, some of the state's False Claims Act also. Okay. Another question, Mitch, my buddy out in Southern California asks, how are whistleblower attorney fees handled? Um, generally, you would, uh, again, we, we handle it on a contingency fee basis with the, uh, with the client. We would take a percentage of the recovery. However, there's also a provision that would award attorney's fees. So that percentage could be offset by um, the court award attorney's fees based on the hours or the work that the attorney later performs. Lance, you had mentioned a few minutes ago that sometimes these cases, while they're still under seal, can be remedied and resolved by the government, but other times they, they probably are pretty lengthy uh, cases in litigation. Can you give us an idea, and I know every case is different, but can you give us an idea of what to expect, assuming it doesn't resolve in that under seal time period, or even an extended under seal period, but actually goes into full blown litigation and maybe even a trial. Can you give us just a broad overview how that would look from a bird's eye view? Yeah, the, from the, it's going to depend on the size of the case because if you're looking at uh, a whistleblower claim against a local hospital or local doctor's office, that's uh, overbilling or billing for services that are not medically necessary or actually services that are not performed, then you're not going to have the volume of documents that you would need. So that case may stay under seal for uh, a year or more. And then when it comes out from under seal, then you probably have another year of discovery to, uh, that you have to go through to get prepared for trial depositions, accumulating the documents and experts. But if you're talking about a whistleblower case against uh, on a national level against a national drug manufacturer for um, a product of off-label use, um, you're looking at an investigation that could stay under seal for two to three years, possibly, and then you're looking at another two to three years of probably discovery just based on the sheer volume of documents that would be produced in a, a case that involves a company and it's nationwide. So it's, it's kind of hard to say um, as, as a general, it's just going to be on a case by case basis. Like any other litigation, it depends on the size of the case and the size of the defendant and the scope of the case. Well, Lance, I, I, I know there's so many things that we could delve into, but I don't want to go down too far down any rabbit trails specifically because it's once you get into the nuances of this, it's just even for, for people who've been practicing law or maybe dealing with these cases for a long time, there's just so much to learn about these. So I want to, as we get close to the end, and I really appreciate your, your time and your expertise, and I know you guys take these cases so very seriously, what, what should we know or what should the general public um, really, are there any other things, I guess, to share about these types of cases? Because when I think whistleblower cases, the, by the time the public hears about them, they're, they're these huge cases because they make the news. So many cases never make the news, but the ones that do, they just become sensationalized. You know, what you see in a movie and what you see uh, in real life are going to be completely, you know, two different things. So I guess I'm asking you for the last word about these types of cases and why they're so important for the public to be aware of how they, they're handled and why they need to go forward. 
Yeah, the, the one thing I would say to anyone that, that thinks they may have a, a whistleblower case, first you have to look, is your company performing in business with the government, with the federal government, and they are, are they submitting improper or fraudulent claims? That's important because that is, those are taxpayer dollars. And I just said last year, the government recovered over $3 billion of taxpayer money. And that's not to say, I mean, how much has gone uncovered? There's a tremendous amount of, uh, of the companies defrauding the government. The government has uh, agencies and investigators, and they do the best they can, but it's just so much money. I mean, you're looking at, I think the, the Department of Defense budget last year was over $700, million, $700 billion. And there's no way that they can monitor every bit of that. So regardless of how small or how big the contract with the government or how much they're building the government, at the end of the day, it's taxpayer dollars that are being taken from us and the, the public in general. And I think if anyone knows of that, they should uh, and feel like they need to come forward they should seek the advice of the council. Well, that council that you guys need to seek is with Lance Gould at Beasley Allen and his team. They're some of the best around, and that's why I've got Lance here talking with me, sharing some of his time and his expertise. And Lance, I can't thank you enough for, for helping to educate the public about this very important areas of the law that not many people are, are really informed about. Robert, I appreciate you having, uh, having me here today. And as always, I uh, know that uh, you, you do a great job for your clients. We enjoy working with you and uh, appreciate the association we have with you. It's always good, nice to work with uh, other lawyers who are out helping those who need it most and care about them. And that's what we've been trying to do here at Beasley Allen for over 40 years. Guys, one of the very best. And as we've been trying to do with the Nomberg Law Firm, of course, I'm Bernard Nomberg, Mondays and Thursdays at one o'clock, all during the month of May, and we're going to spill into June. We're bringing you experts in different areas of society and how it's been impacted by the pandemic. And this is, again, another just fine example of people giving their time and sharing their expertise. So, Lance, thank you again. And I hope that our paths cross again soon, my friend. Thank you, Rob. Thank you. Y'all take care.